kind of theme. I don't think they have. I'm Barry Mathers. I'm going to call the meeting of the Commission on Disabilities and Special Needs to order. I'm the vice chairman of the commission, but today our chairman, Ms. Rollinson, has recently had surgery, and so we would like to say that we wish her a speedy recovery from her surgery. I do not look for her to be on the phone today. Um, she may be she may be calling in, but I don't look for it. So um, if she does, we'll stop and let her on, and then we'll we'll start back. But that having been said, um, I would like to welcome everybody that's here, particularly online and on and on um, on the phone and any other way. We appreciate your taking the time to listen in on us here today and taking your time as time is very valuable, I understand, and taking your time to listen to us and to figure out what we what we want to try to to figure out and what we want to try to do here today to make things better for those with disabilities. Next, if I could, I will. Um, we have a number of visitors that appears me here today. I can just say I will welcome the those that are with the staff. I know most of them at, that are in here right now, but I don't know the guests. So if you don't mind starting on the left, if you're a guest with us here today, would you stand and introduce yourself? On the left, John Adcox, Post and Courier. Nice to see you. Rachel Sharkey, 90 Serapy Falls. Thank you. Hey, Morgan Williams at Ice of South Carolina. Just to get started with the options. Is that all we have today? Um, Barbara Oswald with Special Olympics, South Carolina. Forward one with the Babcock Center. Dean Red, Carlton County. Yeah, I think the rest of us are staff for DDSN. Is that right? <laughs> Unless anybody insists upon introducing themselves with that, we'll leave that alone. Um, and we'll move forward <clears throat> to the meeting notice. Since I've just called the meeting to order, go ahead. A meeting notice announcing the date, time, and place of the April 20th, 2023 commission meeting was distributed April 18th, 2023 to appropriate media and other groups or individuals who have requested notification. The announcement and agenda were posted at the Department of Disabilities and Special Needs Central Administrative Office and on the website. In accordance with Americans with Disabilities Act, the public has been notified that accommodations such as interpreters, mobility assistance, and other assistance will be provided to individuals with disabilities and special needs if requested in advance. I should have said that just, just before that we will have a um, 30 minutes right after this meeting is over, 30 minutes after this meeting is over, we'll have um, a hearing regarding the agency's regulations, which I'll talk more about at the end. But the next item on the agenda is to adopt the agenda for today. So if there's, if there's no deletions or additions to the agenda, can I get a motion that it be adopted? Yes, written. Second. We have a so move and a in a second? Yes. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the invocation, which will be given today by Mr. Ed Miller, and I'd appreciate it if you remember Ms. Wallison in your prayer, sir. Please. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come again on the needs of those that are disability and have ailments that we have been tasked to guide, direct, and help them with a better life. Bless our Chairman Rawlinson. Touch her with a mighty hand. Give her the fullness of life again that she can walk, run, and exercise. Guide us now in this meeting as we carry out the business of South Carolina Commission on Disabilities and Special Needs. In Jesus name I pray we pray. Amen. 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 The next item on the agenda is the adoption is on the in tab two of your booklets. 
it is the um we need to adopt the you know approve the minutes as written unless somebody has a has a deletion or a objection to those i've read them and they seem fine to me i'll make a motion to approve them motion the veins are second Motion is made. Second, is there further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Is opposed? Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the commission update. Commissioner's update. Mr. Coher, you want to go first for us, sir? Being a little bit facetious, my mind is a lot better place because Carolina is winning baseball this year. <laughs> we are number five in the nation league series with Florida this weekend. Go Cox. Right. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> okay, so I do have an update. Um, I just wanted to thank the Lawrence County Disabilities and Special Needs Board for hosting me um, recently um, to uh, provide me with a tour of some of their amazing facilities and um, attended their board meeting um, that they they had. It was great to um, learn about a lot of the um, good services they're providing people in Lawrence County and I uh, just thank them for for um, hosting me and um, uh, and also I learned about um, some um, sensory bags that um, they had purchased and provided to law enforcement, um, first responders, fire stations, and um, police. Um, these are special kits that they um, donated to these um, uh, these these groups that provide um, some comfort if some uh, first responders go into a scene where there's a child or individual with autism and or um, some disability. The kits have a lot of um, things in it, like a weighted blanket and um, uh, some noise blockers or sirens and just to try to calm um, the, the individual that might be overstimulated by an uh, emergency situation. And so I just thought that it was, I enjoyed learning about um, what they were doing there in Lawrence County um, with the sensory kits and um, helping um, serve the community uh, in that way. So um, the other um, update I have is um, there is an um, autism, a Nash, uh, a Nash uh, statewide conference for autism. It's called the National Convergence uh, Autism Summit. Um, Converge is actually the name of it, um, hosted by Springbrook. Um, and it will be hosted um, on May 16th and 17th, so two-day conference um, in Greenville at the Greenville Convention Center, and it will feature um, a variety of topics around um, serving individuals with autism, um, supporting individuals with autism, and um, just a lot of the great research and um, information that's that's being learned about autism and how to support individuals um, with autism in uh, our community. So I just wanted to make sure people were aware of that conference because um, it's a great resource um, for providers and um, caregivers um, wanting more information uh, and to learn the latest about autism. So that is my update. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Mr. Miller, do you want to go ahead, sir? You have an update for us? I don't have anything. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Michelle. I do have a couple updates. Um, I attended the um, Collegiate National um, Wheelchair Tennis Nationals in Orlando, Florida at the USTA um, um, National Campus. And um, it's the only one event of the year where uh, the wheelchair tennis gets together for all the colleges. They have established programs. Um, there's nine universities in the United States. They have established programs and there's five emerging, emerging universities. So that's like 14, um, a lot of room for growth out of considering how many colleges and universities we have. But um, it was great to see all the athletes. Um, it was a five day event. 
And so it was fun to see all the college um, kids um, compete. So that just happened uh, last week. Um, and then I also, and then obviously we had Clemson. So we did have a, a South Carolina school attending. So that was great. I also attended a leisure, a leisure skill clinic um, um, held by uh, Back to Independence. They're right on the border of North Carolina and South Carolina. And it's a kind of like an expo fair where they, um, they cater to those with disabilities for neurotherapy. And they went through the different things that they do, um, the wellness, nutrition, and we also um, walked through different recreational equipment, um, activities that they're provided at the place. Um, so it was, a, it was a fun event and they had a lot of um, adaptive equipment that on display um, for everyone to try out. And that was a pretty cool event to, to attend. Thank you, Liam Barry. It's an update you have. <laughs> David, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Barry, who did you call on? I couldn't understand you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hi, uh, yeah, yeah. This is David Thomas. I'm by phone, so I can't, uh, I can't uh, uh, see uh, if if you're pointing at me or whatever. I have no update. I will have some legislative update later on, but that'll come under, uh, uh, and staff will be presenting on that. Thank you, sir. Well, then I guess I'm the last one. I just wanted to say my only update is that what I should have given last month, which was the dis, which was. I attended the Dis Disability Day about a month and a half ago at the State House, and that was a very interesting. It's an the primary one is an annual event that they have each year, and it was a very, very well done event, and I was very thankful to be a part of it. And um, the commission has been in, has been represented there for the last several years, um, three or four years, I think, is about is about all the time we've been represented there for the last three years, if I'm not mistaken, maybe four. Participated, yeah. Well, we, well, yeah, actually participated, yes, which we should have been doing for a long time, but we are now. So we're um, thankful to be a part of that, and I was thankful to be a part of it. I just wanted to mention that. So anybody that hasn't ever been to that should try to, that is interested in those with disabilities, should try to go. It's a very interesting thing. So aside from that, I will move forward with the next item on our agenda, which would have been public input, but we don't have any. And so, um, and by, by the way, of course, we encourage those who would like to have to, to, to come here or and or to be over the phone that would like to speak to the commission to please do so. Um, our policy says you have three minutes to speak if you would like to, um, but you've obviously signed up before the meeting and we didn't have anybody sign up this month. So maybe next month or anybody that's interested would, would um, we'd be happy to have you. The, and with that, The next item on the agenda is here's me is Autism Awareness Month, which is I think Miss Stephanie Turner is going to come up and give us a couple of minutes on that. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As the Autism Division Director, I come before you today to bring attention to April as Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month. As we know, autism is a developmental disability that can cause changes in verbal and nonverbal communication, social interaction, and repetitive behaviors. And it's often accompanied by medical and mental health conditions that impact the quality of life. As children with autism become adolescents and young adults, they may have difficulties developing and maintaining friendships, communicating with peers and adults, or understanding what behaviors are expected in school and on the job. The CDC recently updated the prevalence of autism to one in 36. And autism occurs in all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. It is more than four times more common among boys than girls. As a state agency that plans, develops, oversees, and funds services for South Carolinians diagnosed with autism, we work closely with individuals on the spectrum in a variety of ways. This includes supporting individuals with autism who live at our regional centers, employing individuals with disabilities, including those with autism, providing helpful resources to individuals and their families, and alerting them of various opportunities. 
Throughout April, DDSN participated in various events across the state in observance of Autism Awareness Month. From the works various organizations do in the community to the interactions individuals with autism may have with law enforcement or other authority figures, we want those with an autism diagnosis to experience the same positive experiences we enjoy. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, ma'am. Quick and concise presentation. Um, the next item on the agenda is our it relates to programs and services, and we have two other presentations um, here this morning for that. One of them is United Truth of Alti, which we've been looking for for some months, and we've and, and they are here today, so we're thankful for that. And also, we have um, we have one from from DHEG, the Division of Children and Youth, which we will get to. But first, in tab, well, it would have been tab three, but I guess it'd be three and a half because we have a presentation here on our desk since we didn't know that until the last moment that, that we had some, some, some presentation material from her. We'll have uh, Ms. Rachel Sharp come up from United States of Ballsy, who's the executive director. Recently, I believe the new executive director for United Air Policy. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for allowing us to be here today. Um, um, hopefully, it won't take up too much of your time, but hopefully, you'll have a little bit more information about who we are and what we do. So, the mission of uh, United Air Policy in South Carolina is to positively support and impact the achievement of a life without limits for people with disabilities. We work to ensure that people reach their fullest potential and that they are part of the lives of their community. Um, we offer person-centered programs and supports uniquely tailored to each person's needs and desires. So a little bit about our history um, in South Carolina. We started in 2003 offering residential services in four homes and one apartment. Um, our day program opened in 2013. Uh, we currently provide direct support services to 88 people in our residential program. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we are a charter affiliate of the National United Service Policy Organization. We provide services in um, five counties currently, uh, Lexington, Richland, Greenville, Sumter, and Clarendon. Our main office and our day program is located in West Columbia. So the services that we provide currently are adult day support and community living support, which includes apartments, homes, post homes or CTH ones, and community homes. Our funding is through the Medicaid waiver and also through donations. So we have special fundraising events throughout the year. Um, we have private contributions and we also have some grant funding. So our adult day support is located in West Columbia. We're open from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., Monday through Friday. And it provides people who attend with opportunities to gain new skills, engage in social and recreational activities, volunteer with community partners, and develop friendships. Uh, we currently support 53 people at our day program. Um, one of the things that we try to do at the day program is to also have community outreach with other community partners and volunteers. Uh, we participate in Meals on Wheels. We volunteer at the Harvest Hope Food Bank. Um, we have worked with Hannah House and Oliver Gospel Mission. Um, we volunteered with the Salvation Army. We held an adaptive toy drive with, in association with the South Carolina Assistive Technology. Um, we also have volunteered at Pet Sync Animal Shelter. We are currently participating in 
part of the Keep the Midlands Beautiful campaign. We are a shoe collection and prep site. So if you have any gently worn shoes that you would like to donate, our office is at 1101 Harbor Drive in West Columbia. We will gladly accept those donations. Um, in addition to those activities, we also try to make sure that um, we are educating uh, the people that we support in different types of things. For example, this month is National Autism Month. We have a whole series of programs um, designed around that. Um, so we, we try to do that every, every month because there's something educational that we can do every month that bring awareness to what else is going on in the world. Um, for our residential program, we have apartments and homes. Um, we support people who want to live on their own and have the ability to do that. Um, we provide staff services as needed based on each person's need. Um, I do say homes because we do have we do serve three people that own their own homes, um, so they're not just in apartments. We also have host homes or CTH ones, um, and those are for people who want a more family oriented type environment. Um, we provide supports to the caregivers and training to the caregivers. Um, at this time, we have two people supported in this program. We've had a couple of people who have retired recently. So. Um, we also operate community training homes. We have those are the community training home twos, the four person residents um, in safe neighborhoods. We staff the home 24 7. Um, we provide opportunities to build friendships, build living skills, assess local resources, work, and engage in their communities. We currently have 20 homes. 16 in Richland and Lexington counties, uh, two in Sumter County, and two in Greenville County. So it's 77 people who get support in those programs. Um, so upcoming events that, that we have, and hopefully um, you guys may be able to join us for some of those. We um, Midlands Give support is coming up on May 2nd. Uh, we would appreciate any donations. Uh, UCP is also going to be the next day hosting a talent show, uh, which always is a lot of fun. Um, we will have our Ride for a Life with the Mad, Mad Hatters Riding Club on June 10th. That's a fundraising event for us as well. And Share the Love Fashion and Auction in December. And that is a really uh, enjoyable event. That's probably one of our, our most well attended events. So what do we want to do in the future? Um, we're looking at expanding our current services. Um, we're looking into developing additional services. Uh, we're going to be incorporating technology to improve the supports that we provide. Uh, we're working very hard on workforce stabilization and development. Um, without that stable workforce, it's going to be very difficult to us, for us to accomplish our other goals. Um, but overall, we want to ensure that we continue the enhancement of a life, the support for a life without limits. Uh, contact information is, is available to you. If you have any questions following this that you didn't get a chance to ask today, feel free to reach out to me. And I'll be glad to assist in any way possible. Thank you for your time. Any questions? What percentage of people do you think y'all have that, that do not actually have cerebral palsy? I know y'all do some people that don't. Uh, um, Probably about 60%. 60% do not have? Yes. We serve all 
We serve people with all types of disabilities, intellectual disabilities, head and spinal cord injuries, traumatic brain injuries, autism. Um, so our name is a little bit misleading, which we recognize, but we do provide supports to all people with disabilities. So you're, I'm sorry, I was just going to ask you, um, you're a DDSM provider? Yes. Okay, because I say you Medicaid waiver, but I just wanted to make sure that, yeah. Okay. What are these, actually you say five counties, but I count six. What are these six counties doing right that nobody else is? I mean, you're there. Um, it's just where we had opportunity to do, do some expansion. Um, and for example, in uh, Greenville, we had several families that wanted us to move into that area to provide support to the <clears throat> family members. And so we have started that process. We have two homes there. Um, the original Lexington was where we initially started. Um, and then we also have two homes in Sumter area. You get any support from local government at all? Uh, no. What other counties are you concentrating on that have a high rate? And why uh, you're not? I noticed uh, you're in about five counties. Um, we're, we're looking for good areas to expand into the, the not only need our services, but also we'll have the workforce to allow that to happen and so um, we're kind of in the preliminary stages of, of looking at different areas to expand it. what counties are you looking at currently that that's not on this listing um we're well sumter is a great area actually um for for job development or um and we're looking at newberry we'll kind of start going out from the center of where our offices are currently located. Um, and also places where we're not gonna have to heavily compete with other providers or um, uh, manufacturing companies and things like that because it becomes very difficult to attract and retain quality staff whenever our wages are not comparable to the manufacturing components. Can you know what your annual budget is? It's, um, we operate with about um, $9 million. Do you offer case management? I didn't see it listed, so I'm assuming. No. Okay. When private providers um, came in to provide services in South Carolina, they had to choose either case management or support services. And so we chose the support services. Yep. Right. My last question. I know y'all are part of it. I could I could ask questions for a long time <laughs> because I have cerebral palsy and I didn't know much about. Feel, feel, free, feel free to call me and we'll I get will, together and talk. I will do that. But I, one last question I'd like to, for everybody else to hear is, um, unless I've forgotten it. Oh, what would you think the major difference between um, United Cerebral Palsy of South Carolina and another national I mean, and the national organization would be or is it really no difference between yours and one in Georgia or another place? Well, actually, the one in Georgia is um, a partner of ours. Um, they UCP Georgia actually helped UCP South Carolina get started in South Carolina and we still um, are partners and and the delivery of services. So, um, and it's not really different. I think most uh, most affiliates around the country uh, provide services to a lot of people with different disabilities, not just cerebral palsy. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. We'll get you off the hot seat. Um, it's very well, kind of you to come by and allow us to and allow us to to be a part of your. Um, I mean, allow us to fill us in on some of your organizational information. Thank you. Thank you, man. Next item on the agenda is tab three in your booklets for those that are looking at the booklets. And it is, of course, 
as I said a minute ago, the ex um, division of children and youth um, that have special care needs. I am here. Good morning. Thank you for um, inviting me and allowing me your time today to present. Um, so in front of you, you can see our um, front page of our flyer. It just kind of gives an overview of our program. Um, but children and youth with special health care needs, even though I'm speaking out of Greenville, we have offices um, throughout the state. Um, we are within DHEC, um, and so we do cover four specific regions. I'm currently representing the upstate region, um, which covers 11 different counties. Um, children with special Children and youth with special health care needs is federally funded under the Title V program. So that's how we get our funding. Um, and we do serve children between the ages of birth to 21 if they have certain qualifying diagnoses. And um, we can provide within some of our programs lifetime assistance for, for select programs. Um, but our primary role is to provide care coordination to families and children, um, as well as funding assistance for needed services and supplies. Um, and then in the past few years, we've really made a push for transition services and talking with families about what to expect um, as their child ages, as far as their health care needs are concerned. Um, so what we do is to make sure that we're communicating with families at the ages of 12, 14, and 17 to make sure all preparations are ready for that child to become an official adult at the age of 18 and what that looks like regarding their health care. Um, and then we do provide um, specific services with nursing, um, with nutrition, and social work within our programs. So again, each region um, operates a little bit differently depending upon the needs of their communities. Um, so I am just going to speak about our primary programs and then what I can speak to specific to the upstate. Um, but we actually have six different programs within the Division of Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs. Um, many of you may remember um, our old CRS, the Children's Rehabilitative Services Program, um, but that's just one of what we do. We also offer hemophilia premia, premium assistance, and that's insurance premiums. We offer sickle cell services. Um, we have a hearing program that is probably the largest program within our division. I would say in the upstate, that's close to 65% of our um, clients are on our hearing program. We also offer special formula um, for, for children who have certain um, dietary restrictions or requirements and um, metabolic disorders. And then we also have Camp Burnt Gin each year. And I'm happy to report that this year we are going back in person, although only at a 60% capacity. Um, so for our children and youth with special health care needs, our big thing is that um, we provide financial services for families who, one, in our hearing program, it's primarily um, families who have Medicaid because Medicaid does not pay for hearing supplies, hearing aids for children. So that is why we have such a large population. Um, but the other part is we do provide financial services for families up to 250 uh, percent um, of the federal poverty level. So in order to qualify for Medicaid services, um, that's 208% of the federal poverty level. So we're really serving that gap um, for families who don't or cannot qualify for Medicaid, but obviously still don't make enough income to cover the needs and the 
and the um, and all the services and supplies that their child with special health care needs needs. Um, so we do have a criteria that you do have to be under 18 years of age to apply for our program. Again, it is based on certain medical criteria. Um, although our hemophilia and sickle cell programs have no age limits. Um, and each year we do um, require that a family provides an annual update so that we are um, reviewing their financials each year to ensure if they are eligible for the program. And then, of course, we do a lot of care coordination. Um, so we're going to work with patients and families and providers to assist um, our families to provide needed services and supplies. We do develop a care plan for each individual coming through our program. We also make referrals to outside agencies and organizations as needed. Um, and then we also link them to needed services such as um, family supports, DDSN service coordination, things of that nature. Um, some examples of, of uh, services that we offer or supplies that we cover, we include um, durable medical equipment and medical supplies. Uh, we can provide up to a 90 day supply of prescription medications, um, especially for our diabetes patients. Um, we definitely can cover those that cost of those medications um, because those are quite costly. And then we also can offer um, dental services to our craniofacial patients. Um, we offer physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy, co-insurance payments, as well as some diagnostic testing in office or lab settings. Um, so there's much more, but those are just some examples of things that we do supply. Um, as far as our Children's Rehabilitative Services Program, that really, those diagnoses are going to cover quite a large array. So craniofacial anomalies, cleft lip, cleft palate, um, if they have seizure disorders, cystic fibrosis, any, any kind of inflammatory bowel disease or an endocrine disorder, um, kidney and urinary disorders, and then any kind of congenital malformations, deformations, chromosomal abnormalities. <clears throat> Here in the upstate, we do have a partnership with Prisma Health. Um, and so we host a craniofacial clinic each month um, at the Center for Developmental Services. We just did one yesterday. We typically see, um, I would say, uh, we schedule 18 to 20 patients at a time on any given day. Um, and again, that's once a month where they can come in and they will see nursing, social work, audiology, our registered dietitian, we'll see an orthodontist, um, as well as an oral surgeon. Um, so they have the opportunity to see all of those um, physicians and specialists within one setting. Um, of course, we also can cover orthodontia services for those children within our craniofacial program as well. Um, and we do cover them up until the age of 18. Now, as far as our hemophilia premium assistance program, um, certainly we can provide assistance for blood products for home infusion and related supplies for those who are eligible. Um, again, that's for hemophilia or other blood coagulation disorders. Um, I won't speak too much about that because that is more of a nursing realm and that is out of my scope of practice. <laughs> um, but we do also offer sickle cell services. Again, we provide care coordination and payment assistance for eligible persons for this. We also do a sickle cell tracking and surveillance um, for newborns based on their newborn here, newborn screenings. So if they do show that they have that sickle cell trait or sickle cell, we will provide that surveillance and care coordination at least for the first two years of life. 
Um, and then, like I said, our hearing program, that is our largest by far. We do provide hearing devices for those with a diagnosed hearing loss. Um, so that could include hearing aids, um, but we also can include cochlear implants and phone anchored hearing aids. We also um, provide services and supplies related to their hearing aid batteries. And we can also offer repairs if the manufacturing warranty has expired. Um, for our clients that are on Medicaid, we can provide these services up to the age of 21. Um, and then beyond 21, they can receive these services as long as they have a waiver. And then our special formula. Um, again, we provide specialty formula for infants and children who have nutritional conditions that affect their normal growth and development. These um, preparations must be prescribed by a physician and our registered dietitian does go over those preparations. Um, our registered dietitian will do a nutritional assessment at least every six months with our families. Um, and we can order up to a three month supply of that special formula at a time. Um, so that is quite costly, um, especially for, um, I would say some of our families that they have um, kiddos with um, uh, cerebral palsy. Uh, I know that she gets uh, probably upwards of fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars worth of formula every three months for her children. Um, so it is a great service that we can provide. Um, I will say that if a family is on WIC. WIC does provide those formulas up until that fifth birthday. Um, so that's within their program. And then we cover those formulas beyond their fifth birthday once they exit off of WIC. And then we also do um, follow up for newborn screenings. Like I said, we've, we've added um, Pompeii disease. We have spinal muscular atrophy. We do first sound referrals and follow up. So if a child fails their newborn hearing screen in the hospital and they don't keep that follow up appointment with an ENT, um, then we get those referrals and we try to follow up with the families um, to make sure that those children are being screened and can confirm if they truly have a hearing loss or if they've passed that newborn screen. And then lastly, we'll talk about Camp Burnt Gen. Um, this is one of our most popular programs, I would say within our, our um, clients. Uh, they do enjoy going down to camp. Due to COVID, it was um, online for a few years, but we are now back in person. Um, and again, we are at a 60% um, capacity this year, but I know that those children and those families are so excited to have that true camp experience available to them again. So again, that's just a little bit about our program um, here within DHEC. Uh, again, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have specifically, um, but I may defer to our um, representative in Columbia, who's Anna Bleasdale, um, for follow-up if need be. Do I have any questions? In real numbers, what is the 208% uh, uh, federal poverty level versus the 250? I don't know the numbers. Sure, no problem. So I will just say for a family of four, we'll use that statistic. Um, right now, if that family of four makes 57,720, um, that's that's eligible for, for Medicaid. So that's the 208% federal poverty level. The 250% federal poverty level for a family, that same family is 69,375. So that's a big gap. Um, and the other difference, which I didn't mention, is that Medicaid goes based on gross income. I mean, no, they go, yeah, they go up based on gross income. We go based on net income. So that adds a little extra, especially for those families who are self-employed. 
any cochlear implants you do a year? Any idea? I do not. Um, I know that most of that funding comes out of our Columbia office, our, um, and so Anna Bleasdale would have that information. Did you say that Medicaid does not sponsor hearing problems? Because they do not pay for the hearing aids, no. Can you update us on genetic trip therapy for sickle cell quickly? Do we have therapy for sickle cell? Genetic therapy. I, I know now there's a procedure where they can actually cure it. I don't know how far along it's gotten, but I know there's been cases reported. Um, I know we'll pay for like doctor's visits and co-pays and um, their insurance co-pays for those visits. We do have to um, provide authorization for those, but I don't know as far as what diagnostics are included. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to thank you, Shannon, for presenting today. There's a lot of case managers that listen to um, this commission meeting and attend this commission meeting, and I think it's helpful for them to know about some services that they might not have been aware of that DHAG offers for children that they serve. So um, thank you today for, for presenting. Thank you for having me. The last thing I wanted to ask is, or the one thing I wanted to ask, I should say, is um, you know, and if you don't know, it's fine. I'm just asking. But I know there's a bill coming through the the um, legislature again this year as it was last year to um, split DHEC and I just wonder how that would affect your do you know how that would affect your program and your situation or do, or do you not know? Sure so um, we will not be affected I mean we're still part of public health regardless um, I think the, the bill is about dividing environmental health versus public health. And so we're under that public health component and the um, maternal child. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I've lost my words, but the, the anyway, I can't think of it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, right. But we, we should not be impacted if they split the, the two divisions. You just basically be a different name. Correct. But we're still the division of, of children and youth with special health care needs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Where is that camp at if they're doing it in person this year? Sure. It's down in Sumter. Um, Marie Amini is in our um, Columbia office and she heads that up. Uh, I know they were looking for um, camp counselors to assist, but a lot of our nurses from around the state go down each time um, that they have camp to check in those children and, and go through their medications and everything. So um, certainly you can look that up on our website uh, and it will give you the link with all the information. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No, thank you very much, ma'am. We're going to move forward. The next item is technically old business, which can also be called in Robert's Rules of Order unfinished business, by the way. Just it sounds a little sounds a little different, a little better to me, but um, so you understand where we are. But the next item on that set of business is our legislative update, which Mr. Rob McGorn. McBurney will be giving us today. I know his name as well as I'm sitting here and still fumble through it, but I'm sorry about that, Rob, but go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just want to give you a quick legislative update. Uh, we are we're, we're past the crossover deadline, so we're, 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 we're moving towards the end of the legislative session. Um, and just wanted to give you a, an update on bills that we're, we're tracking. Um, S343, uh, uh, that is the bill. That would allow uh, agencies other than Department of Mental Health and really anybody other than the Department of Mental Health to, you know, hospitals, things like that, to operate crisis stabilization facilities. Um, that is something that, um, that that a lot of a lot of folks are interested in. Uh, it is a bill that came out of the Children's Committee um, and uh, that. Um, Health and Human Services and this agency and a, and, and a number of others 
are uh, are, are pushing to um, to open up crisis stabilization um, activity and and possibilities uh, in the state. So that is something that has passed the Senate. It's now in the House and the 3M committee, um, and you know we're we're looking to have a, uh, a committee a subcommittee hearing on that um, soon. Uh, they have a couple of bills that they're dealing with that were fairly large um, this week, but uh, hopefully, you know, knock on wood, we'll, you know, we'll be on the next agenda, hopefully for that, um, uh, for this bill. So that, that'll that move it, you know, you know, probably another week or so to get it through the full committee and onto the um, floor of the House. And then that would um, uh, hopefully, if there's no changes, then we can uh, we can get that uh, that bill done uh, fairly quickly before the end of the session. Uh, another the big item that uh, that everybody was watching this week is the uh, uh, the Senate took up the uh, budget on the floor. Um, Senate Finance Committee uh, did a lot of the work, and there was a lot there was not a lot of work done on the Senate floor, which um, uh, you know is. Uh, unusually, it took them took them uh, not very long to get through the budget, um, and uh, the, everything that the House funded uh, is still in the Senate budget. They did add uh, additional funding for um, for our autism eligibility um, uh, evaluations. Uh, that funding is is in the it was added in there, and they also increased our. Uh, the amount of money that, that they fully funded our uh, our ask for the um, for the FMAP uh, for our FMAP shortfall. Um, so uh, that uh, that in addition to everything else, the regional center um, uh, grace, uh, career structure, um, you know, uh, the uh, state nursing plan, the administrative contract support. Uh, all that is still in there. Uh, funding for the community-owned properties, for maintenance on the community-owned properties, and as well as uh, our ask for Greenwood Genetics and our transfer to uh, HHS. It's all still in there. Uh, those are the additional items, the things that they did not fund. Uh, our crisis stabilization ask, and our um, our ask for um, youth uh, autism residential uh, services. So we will continue to work on that. Uh, as we go forward, uh, but uh, but so the House and the Senate have had their have had their say on the on on the budget. It goes back to the House now, and uh, see what see what changes they uh, uh, make, whether they concur with uh, with the Senate changes or not. And we'll probably go to a a budget conference committee on that. Um, other than that, we've got our our regulations that uh, we'll be uh, doing the public hearing for. So we're we're in the, the final. The home stretch of uh, of our uh, uh, period of developing our regular our, our new regulations, updating our regulations. That's been a long time coming, so uh, uh, we're happy to do that. And um, you got anything else? That, by the way, is thirty minutes. I'll repeat again: is thirty minutes after this meeting is over, you'll be um, dealing with the, with that regulation with those regulations in our public hearing. Um, is there any other questions for Rob? I know we have a have another another part B presentation from from Constance, but go ahead for Rob. Um, I just wanted to ask about the um, the 343 bill. Um, if that is approved, um, and we therefore can access the the. I guess the funding, or we well, were that, able no, that to would just allow us to do it. allow us to do it. Okay. Yeah, but right now, uh, in the uh, it's actually in the in, in this confused. This is this is the only thing part of the bill that confused me. I think it's in the certificate of need <laughs> statute, okay. and um, and it just basically says that right that crisis stabilization units be operated by the Department of Mental, Mental yeah. Health. Right. Um, you know that was done a while ago. When, when 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 mental health was the only you know was the only one looking to do that those services yeah. uh, you know a lot of other agencies a lot of hospitals a lot of you have know, seen the need for uh, expanding uh, those those possibilities so that's where uh, uh, that's that's the, the, the impetus for it we just need to change and allow 
to, to, to make the, the allowance for uh, for other agencies to do it. OK, got it. How does the bill define crisis? Was that? How does the bill define crisis? Oh, crisis. Uh, um, it is a um, it's that is that is something that will be regulated by DHEC. DHEC actually licenses uh, crisis stabilization units. Uh, there is a um, a medical criteria uh, for uh, referring them to them. Uh, I'm gonna I'll, I'm if I if I go into I got it on my desk. If I go into it, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna get something wrong. But it, there is a there is a criteria uh, for it. It's uh, a short term uh, stabilization to allow uh, them to be uh, either either placed back in, you know, back home or into some other uh, setting that uh, that is lesser restrictive. Yes. Institution where parents could not do anything with their children anymore because they've they outgrown the ability for them to care for them because of their strength or, the, or their activities. Correct. Will this help us with that? It will help us with some of those cases, yes. Um, the, um, Particularly, you know, uh, dual diagnosis cases, things like that. It will help us with uh, with those uh, people that, that that are in crisis that need to be, you know, that they need to have somebody stabilize their, you know, like medical and what have you, you know, find out what they need and uh, and and address it and get them to a stable point where they can where they can then uh, uh, move on to other services. So it's kind of like a, a intervention. A um, program where they they get them the proper care, the proper right. medication, right. the proper support, so they can get them back into the community right. where right. they can live with maybe their family or right. in a, a home. So that's, right. that's the it, it, yeah. it, it, what is it? Crisis stabilization. It's, it's yeah. a, so it's a crisis situation that we, that we can try to stabilize yes. and uh, and and uh, be able to better serve them. Is that understand? It's approximately sorry. As I understand, it's approximately 90 to 120 days to have on that last. Is that right? Somewhere under? Uh, no, no, it's not that long. It's, uh, no, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a more short term. Uh, uh, Less than 90, okay. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 a, it's a very short term uh, uh, situation. Um, Maybe more like they're based on the diagnosis. You know. yeah. Am I correct in my understanding that there's no more appropriation? than what's currently there. They did not give us our ask for uh, for our for standing up our crisis stabilization unit. Uh, but we've got some other some other avenues that, that we're at where we're exploring. Um, HHS is, has is uh, in the process of budgeting money for hospitals to do crisis stabilization. Um, and uh, we may be able to access those services and contract with those services, that type of thing. So it, there's there there are there are other avenues that we can go down. We, you know, we'd like to be able to fully fund and fully stand up with, you know, uh, what we asked for in the budget. But, uh, but you know, there's other ways to do it. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. McBurney before we go to part B of our legislative update? Hearing none. Thank you, Mr. McBurney. Thank you. So I'm going to briefly give an update on the Senate Bill 602 as it's currently written. Senate Bill 602 was passed by the Senate um, and then introduced into the House and referred to the Judiciary Committee on April 4th um, of this year. The bill has it currently a structure has six sections. Um, the first section being to amend um, the code to provide that South Carolina Department of Disabilities would be headed by a director who is appointed by and serves at the pleasure of the governor. Section two um, also references the director and talks about the director's qualifications for the position. It also adds a definition of autism spectrum disorder. Section three, four, five, and section three, four, five are only the sections that move. Currently, BSN is in Title 44 health. Um, there's a proposal in the current structure of the bill to take us from Title 44, which is health, to Title 43, which is social services. And then Section 6 just says that the entire act takes effect on the governor. Um, the bill, as I previously stated, the bill is currently in the House Judiciary Committee. Um, they had some other subcommittee hearings this week, but did not take this bill up. 
Thank you, ma'am. Um, the next item on the agenda is tab four, is on tab four, which is a conflict free case management update from Ms. Lori Manis. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning. Um, so I'm here to give you an update on our transition to conflict free case management. As you guys will recall, um, we have been working towards a federal requirement of having all case management in the DDSN system conflict free. What that means in our transition framework is that an individual does not receive case management and direct service from the same provider, right? So we started this transition back in July of 2020. There's very specific criteria. I included it in your packet. Um, about the percentage of cases that needed to be transitioned to conflict free by specific dates. So we completed phase three, um, which is the phase before the final phase um, in December of 22. Um, that requirement was that we be 50% transitioned. We were actually 70.4% transitioned. So as of then we have 29.6% of cases that are still being transitioned to conflict free. Um, I included a map in your um, packet also that will show you kind of the counties where there are still a lot of cases in conflict. Um, up until this date, we've not had any provider capacity issues, but we're starting to see some provider capacity <coughs> problems within our system. Those capacity issues around case management have primarily centered around very complex cases. Um, you know, we have a lot of people who have complex needs um, and some capacity issues in other services like residential, which are causing some capacity issues in case management. Um, we're worried that this might affect the movement of some of these conflict free cases, which are, are not always um, the same cases. Um, we held a provider focus group meeting last week to try to talk through some of the capacity issues in all of the services, um, but address some of the case management stuff now, which kind of gives us some things that we can do. Um, and we will also be recruiting new providers into the system to try to make sure that we meet our goal um, we'll be monitoring it closely. I feel as though we're going to meet the goal, but we do have some challenges ahead of us. Any questions? You have to be 100% conflict free by December. Okay. That was a question I had. I thought it's it was December of 23. So we have, you know, several months. Basically the end of the year, December 31st. Correct. And if you remember what happened in the very beginning is each provider, so it was really the boards that were in conflict, right? We already had a system where private providers that came in only did one service. So in the beginning, every board submitted a plan to transition, right? And so what's happened along the way is in phase three, a few of the boards were like, hey, we need a little more time. And the reason they needed a little more time is kind of capacity issues, right? There's kind of this, this, this stuff going on in the system right now. Um, but I think we, we have some private providers who are very willing. They know where they've, they've been sent the map. They kind of know where the cases exist. Um, but it's just a matter of really just getting those moved. So some of it's going to be some close monitoring and pushing um, along the way. We don't want to overload the provider network by doing it all at one time. Um, so some of the places that have larger numbers, we're going to try to work with them to move, you know, some, some slowly. Um, have we been able to bring in new providers in the last year or two to address this at all? Not yet. You know, there was kind of this, um, and Quincy's probably a better person to talk about it than, than I, but we, we had been required to use MMO to bring in 
any new provider related to procurement and we're doing some work with some other agencies and the state fiscal authority. So, so we kind of have a plan. We're hoping that provider entry into the system is going to be a little um, quicker in the future. And I think we're really close to getting there. So. Okay. And if we don't make this deadline, what happens? We're going to make this deadline. I mean, like, what is the penalty? <laughs> we're we're all we I, I I'm not sure, but i we're going to make the deadline. Okay, just check. So, yeah, we're we're going to meet it. I um again, we're still ahead of schedule. Remember that, yeah, right? I just was curious. So we I have every intention of not having to address what happens if we don't. If you remember too, when we started this, we had. 5,000 and 5,700, I forget the number, but we had like this number of cases in conflict. And the first thing we did was turn off the faucet. So we didn't, nobody knew has come into conflict since phase one. So January of 21, right? So, so we're good. Uh, we don't have anybody, nobody knows entering. Everybody that we have has been there um, from the beginning. So, so we know who they are. We know where they live. Um, we, we have a plan. We'll, we'll, I'm 100% sure it's going to happen. And then what is the color coding you mean again? I don't know. You might have said it. Over. There's really no color coding. Okay. It, we just used colors so that you could see each county is more easily. And the number on the county is? Is how many in the county. Um, right, so conflict. that are in conflict. Yes, correct. Okay, so you can see where the hot spots are. You can see where the zeros are. The zeros mean there's nobody in that county that's in conflict. And really, this um, map is intended to provide information to the private providers who are interested in serving these counties, but need to know where they need to, um, you know, put their efforts. And if you're, you mentioned that maybe some of the providers were reluctant to take some of these cases because of their comp complex needs. Is there anything we can do to kind of help? So far, that? so far, the issues that we've seen are not these cases. They're cases that are coming through our office and have complex needs, right? So we've not seen capacity issues where somebody from a county needs to be, be de-conflicted. Yeah. Uh, an existing person who's receiving services, who's typically these are waiver cases, they're in services, they're not the ones who are in a hospital, don't have anywhere to go, right? So, so those are the ones we're seeing capacity issues on, but I worry that because we have so many of those in the system that, you know, it could affect this, which is why I brought it up. Okay, gotcha. So these are not complex needs. Yes, these, these are, are people who are already, so they're receiving residential or day services from a board and also getting case management from the board. So they need to be moved to a, they, they need to get one or the other from somewhere else. Usually what we see is people choose to receive the direct service from the person who's been providing it and they're going to move case managers. There is some reluctance to some of the families, right? Because especially when you start talking about people who um, are in more of the, the rural counties where case managers have been there for a really, really long time and maybe they know their grandma or their aunt or their uncle and they don't understand the concept of, I gotta leave my case manager who I've known forever and I really don't want to. Federally, the concept is the case manager authorizes and monitors the service. You wouldn't want the case manager monitoring their self, you know, the same provider. Let's say there's an issue. When we both work for the same person, it's hard to address the issue. So that's the federal mandate and why it's there. You, you understand it. I'm just saying from a family's perspective, sometimes, so some of these are families that are really just waiting until the last minute. Then we'll leave this. Then we'll leave the case. Makes sense. Right? Change is hard. Sure. Especially for sure. individual disabilities change is really hard. Especially when it's a good thing. So.
that as of the two one twenty three, there's seventy hundred and two cases. My quick map, my app on the map, about a thousand, so seven hundred and two miss. I don't understand quite the difference here. Yeah, there shouldn't be any different. So I'm not sure. I can check the map. I did it in my head. And yeah. Quite a difference. And we did it on like a spreadsheet. So the spreadsheet made the map, made the total. Okay. All right. But the map is a very good. So each time yeah. have it done. Yeah. Add it so that it tells us where we are. And each time, part of the struggle um, is we're we're doing self-reporting. It's a long story, but there's kind of this one service that shows in the system that it's receiving from the board that maybe it's not. So we kind of had to start with actual like manual work. And all of the updates are manual work, so sometimes the updates are a little bit slow. I'm just glad it's various jurisdiction that's doing the work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Is there any other questions for Ms. Maness today? I like uh, have two. Go ahead. You have two? No, I like the map too. It, oh, well, the map, then yeah, the map was a good thing. Um, it really is. I'm not surprised you can come up with such a good idea. So I, I have to be fully transparent. One of my folks did this map. Her name is Janice Moore. If anybody wants to <laughs> say say good work, it was really her. I just take credit for it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thumbs up. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks ma'am. The next item on the agenda is our new business section, which is section five of in your packets, and it is the annual comprehensive property implementation plan, which basically is our five year plan for requests for approval of projects that we are working on. And if I see him getting up, I wouldn't have had to look at the name. This is Andrew Thorne is going to give us the presentation on that situation as he normally does each year at this time. Uh, yeah, thank you for the quick introduction there. And just to kind of recap, I'm uh, here presenting the five year um, capital permanent improvement plan, better known as the CPIP plan, um, for approval of the commission here today. Uh, another quick recap on what this is it's a, it's a five year plan. Every state agency every year is required to submit a five year capital improvement plan to the capital budget office with the Department of Administration. Um, and typically we're here in May, but we're here a month early this year, so we're ready to kind of get some of these things rolling. Um, the plan consists of high priority capital improvement projects, over $100,000. Um, and the way to look at the five year list are our year one plans or things that we're, we're ready to jump right into. Um, year two plans or year two uh, projects are, are things that probably are just outside of that list. And uh, Years three through five, you're probably going to see a lot of a lot of movement there um, over the years of cy things cycle forward. Um, in January every year, we start meeting with um, regional center staff, uh, facility administrators, uh, maintenance staff, uh, financial department to check on the money. Um, we we meet with executive staff, let them know what we're up to. Um, we look at previous year's plan. Uh, we've got a lot of historical data on our buildings. We kind of put everything on the table, um, open it up for discussion and eventually hammer out this, this five-year plan uh, that we're presenting to you guys today. Um, some uh, notable highlights on this plan, um, at a proposed $43 million over five years, it's significantly larger than, than plans from the past. Uh, to put that in perspective, when I took over the engineering director position in August of 2019, the plan that was sitting on my desk that had just been approved was $13 million over five years. Uh, this plan spends almost that much in the first year, so it's a um, significantly larger than the previous plans. Not that we have more needs, but we're putting a lot more paper and, and we're going to you know, take a run at it, try to get it done. So, um, another uh, highlight from this plan is it covers all major outstanding roofing projects um, that we kind of got sitting out there. Um, the agency has about 200 capital assets that we're responsible for. Of those, uh, about 160 of them are actually buildings that people you know, live and work in. Um, of those, uh, 64 of them have a roof that's with an estimated uh, construction cost of over $100,000. So if you assume, you know, a roof's going to get you about 20 years, you should see about three to four roofs every year on this plan. And this plan gets us back on that track. Um, so we're starting to 
address some of those needs. And we've got a lot more money going towards bathroom renovations that are, that are well needed at some of the regional centers. So those are just some big takeaways from this plan. Um, along with the five year plan, we're also seeking approval to, to go ahead and uh, move forward with uh, the year one projects on the plan. And we kind of detail that out a little bit more in the handout. Um, each plan. That's a good rundown of it. Question How many of the items under your one plan were in last year's plan? Most of those, most of those plans, uh, or most of those projects were a year two last year, so things didn't cycle up. So I don't believe any of these were in, in year one last year, so and they were probably in year two or three. That's right, yeah. okay, yeah. gotcha, makes sense. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, any other concerns about maybe year three should be year two or anything like that from anybody? Yeah, if you look at some of the projects, like for instance, we, we kind of analyze what Mark's doing. Um, we've got a lot of generator projects on this list. Um, we did cycle a lot of those up because electrical equipment's expensive now. We, we kind of left them steel or cycled them back. Um, you know, we, we're really moving forward on a lot of roofing and bathroom type projects this year. So we take things like that into consideration when we we put the list together. So we're very thankful to be to have the resources and the um, wherewithal and the for y'all to be doing those bathroom renovations. That's something that should have been done for many, many years. We are very thankful for all of those, and we hope we can get all of them done for all the regional centers. Reasonable amount of time. Um, so you need from us approval? Yes, full approval. Yeah, we, we yeah, we're going to need a need a motion. We may need. We, we have to decide if we're going to do one motion or two. Um, one would be for the five year plan, the other would be for year one, or we can do both together, whichever the commission would prefer. I'm what, what do you think? I feel like, just, I mean, just one motion is fine because, I mean, year three through five is around anyway, so I don't know if it really changes yeah. the fact that if you just do one versus both. All right, we'll do, we'll do yeah. one. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the five year CPIP plan as presented today um, by Andrew and which includes starting on year one projects detailed in this plan um, immediately. Second. Motion being seconded. Is, is there further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Is opposed. Motion carries. We have a five year plan again. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thank you, sir. The next item on the agenda is our financial update from Mr. Quincy Squire. Good morning. With our CFO and financial expert and all those sorts of things who came over from from HHS and we're happy to have him. And how long ago did you come over, might I ask, or do I remember? Yeah, eight months. Eight months. So Feels like eight years. Does that seem like a long eight months or a short one? It's the next question. Depends on the day. Depends on the day. He's still smiling. So, <laughs> so uh, I'll jump right in under tab six. Uh, you'll see the year to date performance of the adopted fiscal year 23 spending plan in the amount of 939 million. But through March, the agency has spent approximately 250 million in cash, in agency cash. And the direct fee for service Medicaid billing expenditures through March were approximately 492 million. So today, the agency is currently on target with agency cash projections, and but we're over uh, by 4.06% uh, on the HHS fee for service side. Um, the variance, that variance is going to continue to increase for the remainder of the fiscal year, mainly due to the spending plan uh, not having uh, those rate increases that came in January uh, built into it for those uh, home and community-based services. Okay, what questions do we have for related to our financial update? Do we have any? A motion to approve what's been presented today as the spending plan versus actuals. 
I mean, uh, the actual expenditure. I was just about to say that, but you sound better than me, so go right ahead. So I'll make a motion to approve what's presented today is the spending plan versus the actual expenditures up to March 31st, right? 331. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. I second the motion. Thank you, sir. You can allow Thomas. our Mr. Thomas, our former distinguished senator, to be the second in that motion so that he can participate from the phone. Um, is there a motion made second? Is there further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Those Aye. Favor? Motion carries. Unanimously, yet again. So, also wanted to, to have one more item just to just to talk about. Um, if, if you guys will indulge me for a minute, um, in regards to our audit policies, we had put out um, for public comment two audit policies, um, or actually one combined audit policy. So, after a meeting last week with the Human Services Provider Association and HHS. Um, we, we are going to make the decision to wait to put out any revised audit policies, even though they have already gone out for public comment um, until Medicaid releases its timeline, as well as any cost report manuals or guidance to DSM boards. Uh, the reason why I say this is because the current process, our templates, um, those formats and timelines were built around a structure that required time for DSN to review 40, over 40 financial statements, um, and cost reports and make necessary adjustments based on our current desk review procedures. Uh, so, and then we had to key it into our cost reporting software that calculated the step down, um, step down Medicaid uh, cost allocation for their requirements. So, the current timeline and the current uh, prescribed process may no longer be relevant based on what they release. So, uh, we're just going to give them the opportunity to set the requirements to the providers. For the Medicaid cost reports, for the financial statements, and any supplementary schedules that they are going to require, because the process is really under their purview now. Um, EFA service is, is changed the financial relationship between the agency and its provider network. Um, fiscal year 21, the agency paid providers approximately $569 million. In 2022, was $527 million. And so this year, currently, we paid $141 million directly to providers. So we in no way want to make the audit process even difficult, costly, or duplicative uh, for this provider network as DDSN's financial support role it continues to be modified, right? So we can and will adopt our policies and timelines if necessary. So I wanted to let the commission know as well as any providers that may be listening that uh, DDSN would not be setting expectations on the provider network without first getting that, that guidance from Medicaid. Um, and then once we all those things are known, then we'll have a discussion on the policy revisions and and when they can take place and what they'll look like based on that guidance. Thank you, sir. Okay, I'll take any comments or questions that you got, my hand. He's still smiling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there like a time when that guidance is expected from Medicaid? Um, when we talked at that provider meeting last week. It, it, there was no like actual, I'll, you know, it's on the list for them to do. But, you know, they've got a lot of things going on over there, but uh, he did make a, you know, a commitment to them to get started on that. So we're hoping soon. Okay. Not an emergency. It really doesn't directly affect anything. Um, because our, you know, because it's you know the relationships changed. You yeah. know, we're really going to be more responsible for like the reward calculations, which. You know, providers don't really need until January you know, to be able to present to the DSM board. So, um, or you know, December or January. So, our timelines are different now. You know, of what we need as at DSM. So. It all relates to the wonderful fee for service, which we're very thankful that our commission was able to achieve. Um, or at least I am very thankful that our commission was able to achieve. I should say. And I think that goes for the majority of us. Is there any other questions for? Nothing was wrong with the week. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, sir. I'm glad to hear that. Um, any up? So, if no other questions, we're going to move on. 
to the next item on our agenda, which is our commissioner's update from I mean, director's update. Why would I say commissioner when we've already done that? I don't know. Um, we, we are doing our interim executive director update for Miss Constance Holloway now. And I'll be very brief. I think you tried to give me a promotion up to commissioner. <laughs> Do you think it's a promotion to be one of us? Bless you. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, so to begin with, I like to continue the trend of spotlighting long term term staffers who have reached significant milestones within our agency. This month, I have the pleasure of highlighting Alisa Best, who works at Salibi Center. Um, Alisa is celebrating 35 years with DDSN. Um, Alisa started as a DSP at PD Center for three years, and then she transferred to the Salibi Center in Hartsville in 1991 to work in the adult habilitation department as a teacher. She's been there ever since and is per presently working as the adult habilitation supervisor at Salibi Center. Um, Elisa says that she's, she has enjoyed working with DDSN to make a difference in the lives of the people we serve, and we are certainly, to ha we are certainly happy to have her as part of our team. Um, next, I'd like to delve into some agency updates um, as well as some fun and exciting things we're currently doing at DDSN. Our employment and day services program have been major contributors when it comes to employment efforts. Through their work, BDSN was able to sponsor Vic Gable, a subject matter expert in the successful employment strategies. Vic trained our provider network on service delivery, employment strategies, and various other mechanisms to increase employment. Additionally, our day services staffers have been traveling across the state to participate in transition fairs where they provide helpful employment resources to students. Um, so students with disabilities can find jobs once they graduate high school. In other areas in the agency, the el eligibility division continues to handle a high volume of cases processing about 800 cases per month. Additionally, the division has expanded the screening process so they can better serve applicants and has started streamlining services for those on the autism spectrum following face to face assessment. Um, as you're aware, to, this month is Autism Awareness Month. Um, hence why I dug in my closet this morning and found the blue because I was instructed to wear blue. And I thought I had tons of blue, Stephanie, but this, this was a hard task. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll be ready next year. I'll be ready next year. We're in blue on selected days and rec um, Autism Awareness Month. We have uh, been highlighting through internal news uh, letters. We're in blue on selected days and recommended various movies and TED Talks to walk. Uh, watch. Eventually, we will, we have and will continue participating in community events and also have conducted interviews with media outlets. I want to, um, we have been really conscious about sending out all the articles that, uh, and interviews that Stephanie has participated in. I want to, you're not on my script, but I'm going off script because that's what I do. Um, I want to highlight Stephanie. Stephanie has been doing an amazing job. She has been going out to local police departments, um, and helping them, giving them different types of training. And she's been highlighted by several different media news outlets um, in the last couple months. Um, I, I had the pleasure of working with Stephanie briefly when I was over at DHHS, um, and we've been excited about how she's come in um, and doing great work in regards to autism. Um, so your hard work doesn't go unnoticed. I know sometimes we get it a little crazy here and people think, they're not noticing all the great things I'm doing, but it's been noticed and it's really appreciated. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to briefly mention some of the exciting things we're doing at our regional centers. Um, at Coastal Security Gate project has been completed and our consumers and staff are now safer with that addition. Also, Coastal and its parents group had a garage sale last weekend. Um, communications invited media. We got a very nice story from the Post and Courier for both that event. Um, elsewhere, our centers continue to serve as strong community partners. Witten recently worked with the blood connection on a blood drive at the center, and Millens is, is collaborating with the South Carolina State Museum on an effort to increase visi visibility for individuals who are dis disabled. Additionally, each center will be participating in our newly launched internship program, which provide on-the-job experience for college students across the state and hopefully boost our employment and retention efforts across um, DBS Center. So that's my update. As usual, we're busy at DSM and we continue to try to do great work. Thank you, ma'am. Very kind of you. Um, the next item on the agenda is our 
executive session for today. We will be taking a as we enter into executive session, we'll be taking a few minute break and then we'll actually enter into executive session. It should be a relatively short executive session. I don't want to give a I don't want to give a time frame to those that are watching, but we will be back whenever we can. So we need a um, motion to go into executive session. There's a question. Um, <clears throat> hey, this this is David. Are we are we supposed to give a reason contractual or whatever um, um, reason before we vote to go into executive session? Well, I was about to do that whenever we did the second, but it's OK. I can do it now. Um, OK, the, the executive, I'm sorry, the, I should, maybe I should have done it the other way, but um, the executive session is regarding. The. Um, discussion of a personnel I mean, matter related to involving. OK versus SCDDSN um, is our reason for executive session. The personnel matter. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there a second? That, oh, but did David, make second. This, okay, David made the second. Motion made yes. second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, motion carried for an executive session. This is the Commission on Disabilities and Special Needs. We've returned from executive session in a very short executive session. And I need to um, have a motion that we come back into session. Second. Second. There have been motion, motion made and second to come back into public session. Is there further discussion? Yes. No. No motions were made. I'm getting there. OK, oh. great. Go. Um, and in that executive session, there was there was. Um, no motions made, no decisions made and no votes taken. But we are in public session now. Um, and and so I would ask, is there any um, further business regarding the regarding business for DDSN for today. Yes, I'd like to make a motion um, to withdraw Mary Poole's March 2nd, 2021 termination letter. By doing so, the commission does not admit to wrongdoing. That's my motion. Admit was your was what you meant to say, right? What? Admit? Ad, we did not admit to right. OK, admit. I think that's what I thought. Yeah, admit. I thought you said admit. Okay. Anyway, um, Admit, admit. We do not admit any yes. wrongdoing. Yes. OK. OK, that's the motion on the floor. Is there any further discussion? I mean, is there, is there a second to the motion? Sorry. We need a second to that motion. Thank you. Um, motion made and seconded. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Is David on the phone? I don't know. That's what I'm looking for. President David there? No, he got disconnected during the executive session. I'm adding him. I still have a quorum. Yeah, we have a quorum. It's no problem. Um, I don't think. I, I Normally, he doesn't plan to come back. And he, um, so, if somebody wants to call in to ask anything, but I, I don't think we need to. Um, okay. I'll make sure that he's fine when, when we leave. <clears throat> okay. Um, That motion is passed. Obviously, is there any is there any um, further business to come before the commission today? Make a motion to adjourn. Unless you have an announcement about the public hearing that you need. To yes, make. I do. I was going to get to that. Um, okay. Thanks, sorry. Um, the public hearing will be thirty minutes from now. It is now um, ten minutes to to about. Well, I'm going to say it's ten minutes to twelve. I don't like give an exact time, so I'll say that we'll start. Let's just say that we'll start at five minutes to one with the with the um, at twelve fifty five with the. Um, with the regulations. Um, so right now it's at eleven fifty five. So it'll be twelve thirty. Twelve twenty five. Why am I saying that? Sorry, it's twelve twenty five. We will start um, with. 
with the Regulation. regulations um, hearing. So I'm trying to say, which will be in here and should be and should be relatively short. Um, considering that we have no presentations that we know of. Um, and with that, the next meeting of the commission is next regular meeting on May 18th at 10 a.m. Um, we don't know at this time whether we'll have committee meetings or not. We're hoping to we're hoping to resume those either in May or in June. We certainly will resume them in June. If we do not resume them, resume them in May, we will see. Um, it depends on business and what the commission feels is necessary. Business that comes before the commission and what business we, we see is necessary. Now I need a motion to adjourn if there's no further business. I'm sorry, Commissioner Mallory, before we adjourn, I want to make sure the record's clear in regards to the motion, because I think we kind of got, okay. we started yeah. looking for David. Um, yeah, we did. There was a, their motion was made by Commissioner Blackwood. Yes. The motion was seconded by Commissioner Woodhead. Woodhead. Um, and then we went, started looking for David. Did we take a vote? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we said those in favor. I just want to make sure. I started looking for David and got sidetracked. Yeah, no, it's good. Okay, Sorry. it's good. We, we, I, I wouldn't do it again. Um, let's just make sure on the record it's clear that who voted and how they voted. Okay, no problem. We will do. Well, but that's a that's a problem because we got to wait a minute because he just went out the yeah. room. But we will we will vote by individual member. No problem. I have no problem there. Did you get Commissioner Thomas back? Trying to get him back because we're going to vote by individual member. While we're waiting for that, may I bring up something else? We're having a public input meeting after this. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And they have to sign up to, to input. Right. They had to sign up before. The, before they, been, has anybody signed up? We initially had one um, group sign up yesterday around what, Rob, 3.30. We got an email from that group saying they no longer wish it to speak at the public hearing, but they're going to they're going to present some written comments and from those written comments, staff is going to meet with them. We're going to sit down and meet with that group. So why are we having a meeting if we have nobody signed up? We're required to by statute. <laughs> <laughs> Same question I asked, Mr. Uh, Cohar. I didn't, don't like wasting time. <laughs> you don't have to be here for it. Right. Not I'm, 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 I'm. Hey, Commissioner Thomas, I got you back on the record. So, um, and Commissioner Miller's, we're back in open session. Um, okay. The motion was made by Commissioner Blackwood in regards to um, the uh, Mary Pool versus DDSN case. And I'll have Commissioner Blackwood just repeat the motion. Yeah, we're going to start over since you weren't on the on the on the in the room when we uh, we read it the first time. So I am making a motion to uh, withdraw Mary Poole's March 2nd, 2021 termination letter. By doing so, the commission does not admit to wrongdoing is the motion. We need a, we need a second for that motion. A second. But David just seconded. Um, is there any further discussion regarding that motion? Um, Okay, we're gonna act, we're gonna vote by individual member. And so um from go ahead. Okay, I Blackwood. I'm not voting, I was not a member of the commission at that time. Okay, sustaining from voting, I guess, would be the way to put that one. Go ahead. Mr. Mr. Woodhead. I would sustain as well if I can. I was not there as well. See. All right. Uh, I'm voting aye. That's one, two, three. David, I'll David, 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 your vote. David, you voting aye. Uh, David votes aye. That's four. But we have a majority, so it's fine. There's there's two. Um, there's four ayes in favor. There's none opposed, but two sustain from voting, which is essentially saying no. But it's not. But it technically, well, it's essentially saying no. 
No, it's not saying. No, it's not saying. No, it's just a state. That's not a thing. Yeah. Chair, Chair, you don't need to interpret uh, interpret that. No. So the motion, the, your motion will carry because you have four in favor. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So what's next? Do we, we need a motion to adjourn. Now we need a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Motion made the second to adjourn. We are adjourned because once you get a motion second, you are adjourned. Okay. We adjourn.